All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Galen Panger. I'm a third year PhD student at the UC Berkeley School of Information. Um, and I was really um, excited that Camille uh, invited me to speak a little bit about one of my research projects in visualizing public opinion, uh, mixed feelings specifically, and then give a little bit of, um, talk a little bit about some of my upcoming dissertation uh, 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 work. So the title of my talk is Big Data, Rich Data. And I think in the space of uh, visualizing public opinion, um, one of the key things is how rich is the data that we're getting? And um, what, can we, um, what can we do with that data? How can we visualize it? And I want to start with a quote from Hilary Mazin, who's a chief scientist at Bitly. Um, and she was asked by the Wall Street Journal about what were the qualities of um, what were the qualities of people she was looking for when she was hiring uh, for data science uh, positions? And what were sort of the qualities of a data scientist she was looking for? Um, she said they can take a data set and model it mathematically and understand the math required to build these models. And they are someone who can find insights and tell stories from their data. That means asking the right questions, and that is usually the hardest piece. And I think that that's sort of a challenge to people who are using um, new media and using um, sort of big data techniques um, to um, talk about public opinion. Well, are we asking the right questions? Are we using the right measures? Um, and are we, are we using the data that we have, this overwhelming amount of data we have, are we using it to tell compelling stories? Um, so far, I think, you know, in the era of, of big data, public opinion hasn't really changed very much yet. Um, this is the latest research from Gallup. 53% of people approve of President Obama and 42% disapprove. And that's sort of our picture of public opinion. You can add time to it so you can see how it varies over time. And you can throw, throw it up on a map so you can see where in the country people approve or disapprove of President Obama. But most of the questions that we ask in major public opinion research, so actually 13 of the um, 16 major polling firms ask a binary question about President Obama's favorability or approval ratings. And only three of them actually give you a, a choice of do you strongly approve or you know, only slightly approve or are you neutral? And I think that that's sort of a really big, an interesting area where now that we're moving into the space of big data and social media, we have an opportunity now to enhance the nuance and the complexity and the detail and the texture of how we represent public opinion. So um, one more example of a binary question um, was President Obama uh, came out in support of same-sex marriage earlier this year, or last year, I should say. And the New York Times had this big, splashy headline about how um, everyone was skeptical about his motives. Was it for political reasons, they asked people in the poll, or was it for moral reasons? And people said, political reasons. Now, if you ask any historian looking back at this moment in time, I think that they would tell you that, well, actually, President Obama had a, a combination of both political and moral, personal moral reasons uh, for coming out in support of, of same-sex marriage. But the way that the question was asked to the public was, is it either or? And the question to me is, is this really what the American people think, or is there more texture, is there more nuance looking underneath it? And I think in the era of big data, we have even um, some more alarming examples so far. Um, you know, likes are sort of one of the biggest currencies of the web, but what does that really tell us about public opinion? It's a unary, actually. Um, it's rather than binary, it's unary. You can like something or have an absence of likes. And so when you're talking about public discourse, we're talking about public opinion. I mean, 10,000 people like climate change. I mean, what does that mean? Does that mean that they want it to happen? Um, is, that, is that sort of what's shaping our public opinion discourse now? Um, is it, you know, are people supposed to like abortion? Are they supposed to like racism? I mean, uh, I don't know if you guys saw that Tumblr yesterday that was going viral, but um, with the new graph search Facebook has, you can actually search for all the people who like racism and see them. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's public discourse. I don't know. Um, that's not to say that there isn't any real public opinion um, value in likes. I think that there is, certainly, and there's obviously business value. Um, after the election, you can see the like count and how, for Mitt Romney and how that changed. Um, it's kind of interesting. There was a blog that showed you in real time the likes that were coming off of his uh, profile on Facebook. Kind of sad, but kind of funny. So we're in the era of big data, but is it rich data? And 
Right now, public opinion generally looks like this. It's a Likert scale, Likert type scale, where you can say that you, know, you feel strongly about something, or maybe in the middle, or maybe uh, strongly against it. And this is better than what most of the public opinion firms are doing right now in polling. This, this is the standard. You use a Likert scale, and you get, give someone an opportunity to be strongly or not very strongly uh, feeling about something or some issue. But one of the most um, widely cited, sort of one of the founders of the modern public modern public opinion, um, coined the term in 1995, the problem of the overstuffed middle, which is that in the middle of the Likert scale, there are a lot of things that sort of can be packed in, a lot of different distinct kinds of opinions and feelings, um, and that the, the job of public opinion researchers should be to unstuff that middle a little bit and to help add some more shade to um, public opinion. So his name was Phil Converse. I don't know if I mentioned that already. Um, you can be in the middle because you're neutral and you're like Switzerland, you're, a, you're staunchly neutral. You can be in the middle because you're indifferent. You can just not really care. Um, you can not really have enough information to make a decision. You can have not done much introspection on the issue and be unsure how you feel. Um, and another one is that you can have mixed feelings or ambivalence. So when you are saying, oh gosh, I really feel strongly negative about this issue, but I also feel strongly positive where do you report on the Likert scale? What is, so you might report on the middle, just sort of saying, hey, these, these feelings cancel out, so I'm just going to report in the, mi the middle. But actually, um, it's not the case. And actually, um, about a decade, uh, two decades of, of neuroscience and brain research has shown that positive and negative processes operate fairly separately in the brain. They have our positive negative, our positive um, sort of brain systems react differently than our negative systems to information. So they're distinct processes and maybe they should be measured distinctly. And they, they co-occur for us. Positive and negative feelings come up for us together sometimes rather than canceling each other out into some sort of neutrality. And they're also distinct from other mental responses. So, um, so we chose this as, uh, my colleague Brian Ria and I chose this as an opportunity for visualization. And one of the last pieces of evidence was from, that that we took to um, use to decide to study mixed feelings was one of the most widely in cited interview studies in the public opinion research. It's a qualitative piece of research, really good study. The, one of the key quotes and most ci highly cited quotes from this is, given the opportunity, people do not make simple statements. They shade, modulate, deny, retract, or just grind to a halt in frustration. And that's what really public opinion is. This is the reality of it. And by using Likert scales or by using binary choices, we're denying people, we're sort of covering up a lot of that texture. So what, what these methods do is many of them take the Likert scale and split it into two pieces and ask people to respond to the negative side and the positive side. So if you go to our visualization at mixedfeelings.us, I invite you to open your laptop and go there if you want, play around with it. Um, you, get a you get to take a quiz at the beginning to sort of introduce you to some of these techniques. You can say, okay, overall, how do you feel about Facebook? Well. Thinking only of positive aspects of Facebook, I feel not at all positive. I feel very positive, slightly positive, whatever it is. And then thinking only of negative aspects, I feel not at all negative, slightly negative, negative, very negative. And so we did a lot of brainstorming and sketching. We surveyed um, about 30 undergraduates just to get some data on this about on about 15 topics of public opinion. And um, we wanted to visualize this in a way, and our goal was to help introduce people who weren't familiar with the concept of ambivalence or mixed feelings, how to introduce them to um, these measures and the data from it. And our main goal was to show how this data could help unstuff the middle of the Likert scale. And so along the x-axis, we use basically the person's overall position on the issue. So we take their negatives and minus their, uh, or their positives minus their negatives and put that on the x-axis scale. And then on the y-axis, we sort of unstuff the middle by showing how um, mixed their feelings are. So here's what the basic visualization looks like, sort of an upside down V triangle shape. Um, and um, so you can see that this is actually what they, how the undergraduates came out on Facebook. This is the, one, the issue that was surveyed as the most highly ambivalent. People were the most ambivalent about Facebook of the issues that we surveyed. Um, so they had their sort of, the dots sort of cluster up towards the top and in the middle because overall their positions cancel out to neutral, right? Somewhere in the center. 
Um, but you can see that people have sort of a mix of, uh, sort of a range of mixed feelings um, that underlies that, um, that position. So if you go, you can see we have a whole bunch of different topics uh, that we surveyed, and they're all sort of, they all sort of end out in this general V shape. Um, if you're overall in the lower right-hand side, basically most of the dots, if they're there, then that means people are strongly positive overall. On the other side, it's mostly strongly negative and not positive. Um, sort of in the middle of the lower half is indifference, and then the upper half is some mix of um, mixed feelings. So the last thing I wanted to talk about in the couple of minutes that I have left um, was a little bit about my dissertation research and some of the questions that I want to ask. And this is about, okay, we've got this new data in um, new media, and we've also got these traditional public opinion methods. And do we know anything about how they relate? Do we know what um, Twitter can tell us about public opinion? And one of my favorite graphics from, um, from the election was, can Twitter, and this is from the Oxford Institute, Internet Institute, and they did on election day, they did this graph that showed uh, the number of mentions of Obama versus uh, Romney in each state. And yes, if you take the overall picture, yeah, um, there were a lot more mentions of, of Obama on election day before polls closed. And so, well, I guess Twitter predicted the election. But actually, you know, all of the red states were actually blue states. And there are a number of blue states here that were red states. And so I think this, this is sort of a silly example, but it highlights how if you just take the raw data, you're not going to get an accurate view of public opinion. You're not going to uh, be able to, um, what's really happening here is the people who are supporters of Obama are outweighing the supporters of Romney in a lot of different places. And you may not know why people are talking about Obama or Romney. Another of the techniques that people use a lot is sentiment analysis to look at, um, and Michelle talked about this, but um, to look at the overall sentiment as a positive or negative. And one of my favorite examples, an early example from Adam Kramer, early being two years ago, Adam Kramer at Facebook um, did something called gross national happiness where he looked at the positive and negative words on Facebook and he used a technique, a word count technique, which is the most um, commonly used technique of counting positive and negative words to see when people were happiest and saddest at Facebook, on Facebook. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's were the most positive. And, um, and uh, I think that's sort of interesting. Is it because people are wishing each other happy holidays or is it because people are really happy? Well, I don't know. I think that's one of the complexities of this data. Um, and there was also the saddest day in Australia over this time period was when the Prime Minister said that he had um, apologized for some, something he had done. And that was the saddest day. Or was it? Or was it just a lot of people talking about how he had apologized and said sorry, which are negative words? Um, but I do think there is some plausibility. There was a really cool study about sort of tracing circadian rhythms throughout the day. People are happiest on the weekends here. And then they, you can see that people are sort of happy. There's a little bump in the morning, and then people get happier towards the evening. Um, and I think that there's so much rich data. This is from We Feel Fine, which was a, sort of analyzed a whole bunch of uh, feelings from the blogosphere. And there's a lot of really cool insight that you can get from this sort of emergent participatory data online. For example, a lot of people in the blogosphere on Valentine's Day feel lonely. And actually, that seems to be more prevalent than people who feel special or loved. And that's sort of an interesting thing to know about public opinion, right? Twitter trends, for example, this is when Steve Jobs died. There are all the, the, tr the trends, you know, were thank you, Steve, I said, I heaven, um, Steve Jobs, et cetera, which I think, you know, social media is telling us so much about public opinion and what's on people's minds, but we still don't really know. We don't really know what, um, how that relates to our traditional public opinion uh, methods. And so part of my research, I want to look at three what I'm calling biases or discrepancies from traditional public opinion. One is a selection bias, which is just different people are who is most likely to be participating in, in social media. Um, we know, for example, people who are extroverted are more likely to tweet, and people who tweet, who people who are extroverted, are also more likely to be more positive. So we'll, we might get a little bit of a positive bias because of um, the people who choose to participate. Um, there's also a salience bias, um, wherein people are only talking about something on social media when something's really salient to them. But what about all the other, you know, people are getting called up by public opinion firms when something's not even salient to them. They're being, they're being told, like, what do you approve or disapprove of President Obama? And I want to know a little bit about how does that difference, how does that relate, and, and, and can we measure that? And then, of course, there's error in sentiment analysis. So the last thing is just, you know, one idea is to instrument our status update boxes with some measures to get a, a sense of 
um, how people are really feeling at the moment of their status update. So um, that's all the time I have for now. Um, thanks very much.